This episode from 1992 begins with Data's head buried in a hole, and there are still people trying to say Star Trek hasn't always been horny. This is a review of the classic Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Time's Arrow. If you have not seen this episode, and you don't want to know what happens in it, be warned, spoilers beyond this point. Time's Arrow is the two-parter that connects Season 5 of TNG to Season 6. It's not quite as well-remembered as the show's other season-ending cliffhangers, like Best of Both Worlds, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Perhaps it's just different. That's not a sin, you know, though you may have heard otherwise. To quote my least favorite episode of this show... <laughs> As part one begins, the Enterprise has been recalled to Earth because archaeologists excavating a cave in San Francisco have discovered a few things they think Captain Picard and his people might find interesting. There's a pair of bifocals, an antique revolver, a gold watch, and oh yeah, Data's severed head. Data's 500-year-old severed head to be precise. Also, there are traces of something called triolic waves, which don't naturally occur on Earth. Is this evidence that extraterrestrials visited Earth hundreds of years ago, when the rest of this stuff was apparently left in this cave? I don't know. Geordi does some CSI shit and finds a fossilized microorganism left in the cave, an organism that's native only to the planet Davidia 2. So the Enterprise goes to Davidia 2 and finds... nothing. No signs of life, but data detects temporal disturbances and triolic waves like the ones they found traces of in San Francisco. Picard orders an away team to investigate, and data gets up to join them, but Picard's like, whoa, where are you going? Data says, I thought I'd head down to the planet. Are you serious? Dead serious. See, the thing is, everyone else has been kind of wigged out by the whole data's head winds up in a cave thing. Picard doesn't want Data going on the away mission, keeps him on the ship where he's relatively safe, but Data's super fine with it. He says, actually, I find it comforting because it means I'm a step closer to being human. My life will have closure. Someday I'll die. Oh, Data. Sweet, naive, season five Data, if only you knew. Riker leads the away team through a cave on the planet's surface. It looks empty, but Troy's empathic abilities allow her to sense the presence of life. Not just life, but human life. Up on the Enterprise, Data runs an analysis of sensor readings of the cave and figures out that there are life forms in the cave, but they exist slightly out of phase, which is why the away team can't see them and the Enterprise's sensors can't detect them. Geordi hypothesizes that he could correct for the phase difference, if he had a technobabble gimmick sensitive enough to make the minute adjustments necessary, but unfortunately, he doesn't have a technobabble gimmick that sensitive. But Data chimes in and says, Oh, I have a technobabble gimmick that sensitive in my robot skull. Picard reluctantly sends Data down to the planet, and Data uses the super-sensitive Technobabble gimmick in his robot skull to adjust himself into phase with whatever is in the cave. The rest of the crew can't see what Data sees, nor can we, but Data maintains an open comm link and describes it for us. Weird people with no mouths and big holes in their foreheads, eating energy fragments that have been delivered by two individuals, one of whom has what Data calls an Ophidian. Then, Data gets too close to the Ophidian, something happens, and Data vanishes. Cut to Data in the middle of the street, in San Francisco, in 1893. Well, that's certainly a problem. But Data gets right to work trying to figure it out. He goes to a hotel where he meets a helpful bellhop who correctly clocks him as wearing pajamas, then points him in the direction of a poker game, where Data antes up by selling his com badge to a human ancestor of Gul Dukat for $3 and proceeds to clean out the entire table. Data gets a room at the hotel, and the bellhop, whose name is Jack, runs out to fetch a list of mechanical components for Data, who claims to be an inventor. Data glances at the newspaper and sees an announcement for a reception, accompanied by a photograph of Guinan. 
So, Data gets dressed up real nice and crashes the reception, where Guinan, along with a bunch of other socialite types, are listening to Samuel Clemens, the one and only Mark Twain, hold court about how foolish it is to believe that humanity is the center of the universe, or that the Earth was created solely for their benefit. Data pulls Guinan aside and says, Okay, so, I'm from the future. And at first I thought you were from the future too, but now I realize you're not from the future. You're just here on Earth in the past because your species lives a really long time. Even so, I need your help because aliens from the future are coming here to Earth in the 19th century for some reason, and I need to find them so I can stop them from doing whatever they're doing and also return to the 24th century. So do you want to help? They both notice some smoke wafting in from off screen and turn to see Mark Twain standing in a nearby doorway spying on their conversation. That old rascal. Meanwhile, back in the 24th century, Geordi has worked out a way to phase shift everybody onto the alien's wavelength. Captain Picard talks to Guinan, who tells them that if he doesn't go on this away mission, the two of them will never actually meet. And Picard's like, well, that would be weird, I guess. So he gets his ass down to the planet, and Geordi does his thing and adjusts his technobabble gimmick so that everyone can see the freaky white forehead mouth aliens that Data described earlier. Then here comes the guy with the Ophidian, the snake, and his partner, and they open up a time portal. The away team follows them through the time portal, and it's see you in September, everybody! Have a good summer! When we pick things up in part two, some time has passed. The TNG crew has been in the past long enough to acquire disguises, so they blend in with their surroundings a little better. They've even got a room with a colorful English landlady. And they've made some headway in figuring out what these time-traveling aliens are up to. Beverly has somehow gotten a job as a nurse at a local charity hospital, and she's discovered that the victims of a local cholera epidemic didn't die of cholera at all, but of having their neural energy completely drained away, which is apparently bad for you. Remember those energy fragments the aliens were eating in the cave on Davidia 2? Riker, who is disguised as a cop, and Beverly surmise that the aliens are using human neural energy for food and are harvesting it from Earth's past during a time of widespread sickness so as not to raise suspicion. It's actually a really good idea. Too bad someone left Data's head in a cave or they would have gotten away with it. Meanwhile, Bellhop Jack, who, it turns out, is, get this, Jack London, lets Mark Twain into Data's hotel room while Data is away so Twain can do some snooping. Data comes back with Guinan, so Twain hides in the closet. They discover him soon enough, though, and he tells them he knows all about their infernal time travel plot, and he intends to expose them and save humanity from whatever they're planning. Back at the charity hospital, the aliens show up, disguised as a 19th century man and woman. The time travel snake is also disguised as a fancy cane. Beverly detects the aliens with her tricorder and calls for reinforcements, and the rest of the crew arrives and grapples with the aliens, who soon disappear, leaving the snake cane behind. The disappearance of the aliens registers on the machine Data has built in his hotel room, and Data runs off to investigate. At the hospital, the real cops show up, discover that Riker is a fake cop, so Riker punches out the real cop, and they make a run for it. Data pulls up in a carriage, and they all pile in and get away as some more cops run out and give chase. So, the gang's all back together again. They return to the flat that Picard and the others have rented, and Geordi figures out that the aliens have been using the cave, the one where they found Data's head in the 24th century, to focus the effects of the time travel snake. But in this century, the cave is located in the middle of a military base. So, Data picks up Guinan, who uses her societal influence to get them access to the cave. They go to the cave, Mark Twain shows up with a Colt 45, still believing they're villains and still determined to stop them. Then, the aliens appear. The time travel snake activates and a portal to the future opens. Data and one of the aliens fight over the snake, and a burst of energy explodes from the snake, knocking down and injuring Guinan and blowing Data's head off. One of the aliens is also injured, but the other one runs through the time portal. 
Picard orders the others to follow him, and they do, as does Mark Twain, who jumps through the portal just before it closes. Picard stays behind to care for the injured Guinan, realizing that this is what future Guinan meant. From her perspective, this is how she and Picard first met. The rest of the crew arrives back in the 24th century, along with Mark Twain, along with Data's headless body, which still has the time travel snake in his hand. They beam up to the Enterprise. Troy offers to escort Mark Twain through the ship while Geordi takes Data's body to a science lab and tries to reattach the 500-year-old head they found in the cave. Mark Twain isn't very impressed with all this future technology. Oh, sure, he tells Troy, you who serve on these starships get to live it up, but what about the poor? Troy says, actually, on Earth, we solved every single one of our problems, and it's all great all the time. And Twain's like, oh, okay then. Riker wants to go back to the 19th century and get Captain Picard, but Worf is like, dude, we need to kill these time-traveling aliens right now. I say we nuke that planet from orbit. And Troy says, Worf's right. Let's vaporize that whole goddamn place. But back in the 19th century, Picard has learned some alarming news. Thanks to a timely bit of exposition from the injured alien who was left behind, Picard realizes that if the Enterprise launches torpedoes at the cave on Davidia II in the 24th century, the explosion will be amplified through the time distortions and destroy 19th century Earth. Theorizing that the destruction of 19th century Earth would not be in the best interests of 24th century Earth, Picard grabs Data's severed head and, using an iron filing, taps a message into Data's brain using a binary code. In the 24th century, in the Enterprise's science lab, Geordi reattaches Data's head and boots him back up, and Data receives the binary message, warning them not to attack the cave. Riker holds his fire, and Data explains that if they want their torpedoes to destroy the aliens instead of past Earth, they need to modify them so they have the same phase variance as the aliens. Geordi says he can do it, but it will take a few hours. In the meantime, they can rescue Captain Picard, but there's just one problem. Geordi can only figure out how to get the Time Snake to work well enough to transport one person at a time, which means that in order to bring Captain Picard back to the 24th century, whoever goes to get him will have to remain in the 19th. Mark Twain steps up like, well, I mean, the solution to this is pretty obvious, right? It is. Mark Twain uses the Time Snake to return to the 19th century, passes it to Picard, who uses it to return home. They use the modified torpedoes to blow up the alien time travel cave. Picard goes to Ten Forward to share a knowing glance with Guinan, while in the 19th century, Mark Twain supervises as the injured Guinan is helped out of the cave by medics. Twain picks up his pocket watch, which he dropped earlier, but thinks again and decides to leave it behind so it can be found by the future archaeologists. Twain leaves and the camera pans down and settles on the final shot so we can end where we started with Data's severed head. Full circle. As much as I enjoy stories like The City on the Edge of Forever or Trials and Tribulations where the plot is driven by the heroes trying to stop history from being changed or restore it to its previous shape following a change, I also appreciate episodes like this one where time travel is used to transport the characters to a new and unique setting, but where the timeline itself isn't really what's at stake. The aliens in Time Zero aren't trying to change history, they're using history to hide in while they carry out their business. It's never suggested that the aliens killing people in the 19th century under the guise of a cholera epidemic is changing history, it's just that it's wrong and they need to knock it the hell off. The fate of the world isn't at stake until the last few minutes of part two, when the Enterprise almost unknowingly destroys Earth in the past by firing torpedoes before adjusting for the phase variance. And even that is only introduced to motivate Picard to tap the message into Data's head. For most of the episode, the fate of the world doesn't hang in the balance. The stakes are smaller and more personal. What's going to happen to Data? What are these aliens up to? How is everyone going to get back home? And that's all it needs to be. 
Because the stakes are more personal, and because this is a two-parter with a bit more breathing room between plot points, we have space, especially in part one, for scenes that show us how these characters are struggling to deal with their knowledge of Data's apparent fate. Some of that comes through in the form of dark humor. I've always loved the start of the scene after the opening credits in part one, where Data and Geordi are studying Data's head from the cave, and Picard walks up and says, Mr. Data, is this yours? There's also a sweet moment where Riker explains his discomfort regarding Data's imminent death by mimicking Data and saying that he has become accustomed to Data's sensory input patterns. And Data just nods and says, Thank you, Commander. I'm fond of you as well. What the first half of this episode does is remind us, more emphatically than any episode since The Measure of a Man in Season 2, that these people love Data. The prospect of losing him is devastating to them. I had my issues with the first season of Star Trek Picard, but one complaint about it that I found puzzling was when people would say, Oh, since when was Picard ever so attached to Data? Um, since always? Watch how Picard reacts to the prospect of Data's death in Time's Arrow. Watch how protective of Data Picard is. Then try and tell me Picard's lingering grief about Data in Picard Season 1 doesn't make sense. Come on now. But, of course, despite the looming apparent death of Data, the circumstances of that death, of how Data's head wound up buried in a cave for 500 years, are so bizarre and mysterious that the episode is anything but sad. The apparent death of Data provides the inciting incident for the plot and imparts a certain amount of gravity to the proceedings, but the story unfolds in a way that is never depressing and is frequently a lot of fun. The storytelling is quick and efficient, especially in part one when everything is being set up. The timing and editing are flawless and serve not only to move the plot along at a brisk pace once the time travel starts, but also to get some solid laughs. I love the cut from Data starting to deal at the poker game to Data walking into his hotel room wearing a vest and fancy hat. No need to show us the game. The picture tells us everything we need to know. Moments like this also give Brent Spiner a chance to show off his comedy chops, his facial expression and body language as Data enters the hotel room and hangs up his hat after the poker game are reminiscent of Buster Keaton, as is the moment when Data effortlessly picks up an iron anvil, then realizes he needs to disguise his super strength while Jack is around and immediately drops it and acts like he's hurt himself. There's another subtle editing gag that I enjoy. It's not exactly funny, but it makes clever use of our expectations of the show's typical rhythms. When Data vanishes from the cave on Davidia 2, we cut to a reaction shot of Picard. And this sort of silent, stunned, dramatic close-up is normally the shot on which we take a commercial break, but instead we cut to Data on the street in 19th century San Francisco. We might not even realize it consciously, but it's a deviation from the established norm and provides a bit of a jolt. The episode also makes very smart use of the gap between the two parts. Instead of picking up exactly where part one leaves off, part two begins sometime later, when enough time has gone by to allow Picard and the others to have gotten new clothes and a place to live in the 19th century. Where did they get the clothes? How did they get money? How did Beverly get a job as a nurse? It doesn't matter. We don't need to spend screen time on it. By the time part two starts, it's been done, and we can just move on with the important stuff. The story is complex enough so that when part two begins, we have multiple meaningful setups that need to be resolved. Part one ends as the crew walks through the time portal, so first and foremost, we need to see what happens there. We need to see how the time-traveling aliens are stopped, but we also need to see how the Picard and Guinan thing turns out, what role Mark Twain will ultimately play in this, how our heroes will make it back to the 24th century after they complete their mission, and most importantly of all, what happens to Data? Not just with his severed head, either. More basically, Data and the rest of the heroes have been separated. We want to see them back together. How will that happen? When? 
It's a compelling setup, and we're on the hook for the payoff because we care about data, we care about the others, and we believe that they care about each other. The setup and payoff of the aliens and their phase-shifted world is well executed also. First, Data phase shifts himself while we remain with the other characters, and we hear Data describing the aliens and what they're doing. Then, later, at the end of part one, the rest of the heroes phase shift, and this time we go with them and get to see for ourselves what Data was talking about at the same time the heroes are seeing it. It's an effective way of creating anticipation and connecting our point of view with that of the characters. I like the way the episode uses Guinan and Guinan's friendship with Captain Picard. It gives Picard a reason to join the mission and take part in the time travel shenanigans. It sheds a bit more light on the nature of Picard and Guinan's relationship without destroying the mystical, enigmatic nature of it, and it makes clever use of Guinan's long lifespan, allowing her not to time travel, but to exist in both time periods at different ages. Data's head is used in a similar way, to allow characters to communicate from one time period to the other without the use of time travel per se. Guinan also provides the means of introducing Mark Twain into the story, which feels like something from an original series episode, and I definitely mean that as a compliment. Twain's presence in the story is enjoyable, and Jerry Harden is delightful in the role. His Mark Twain is intelligent and cynical, but also an alarmist reactionary and a shameless busybody whose involvement in the story comes as a result of his determination to mind other people's business. He's great, but he's also something of a missed opportunity, I think. The scene where Twain talks to Counselor Troy aboard the Enterprise disappoints me. There's potential there for something more. Twain acknowledges the achievement represented by the Enterprise, but he also questions the motives and the morality of the society that created it. Is it really realistic to assume that the Federation has nothing about it that could be seen as militant or imperialistic? And what about the poor? But the same Mark Twain who is bold enough to ask these questions is immediately satisfied by Troy's answer of, the Federation is peaceful and we eliminated all of those problems on Earth. Not only does it come across as simplistic and self-congratulatory, it doesn't play dramatically. Twain doesn't take the Enterprise at face value, but then Troy tells him that everything really is as great as it looks, and he takes that at face value? His skepticism disappears after he's reassured by one person from the society he's cross-examining? Okay. If this were an episode of a Trek series from the current era, or hell, even an episode of Deep Space Nine, Twain's questions wouldn't have been so easily dismissed. But TNG, as great as it is, and as much as I love it, is not that kind of a show. Instead of pointing out the flaws in the Federation's facade, the episode uses Mark Twain to argue that there are no flaws after all. Oh well, we'd get there eventually. Twain's presence is just one of the many delightfully oddball details found in both parts of Time Zero. There's also the bellhop, who just so happens to be Jack London, the random English landlady who Picard charms out of collecting the rent by offering to cast her in his fictitious production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and the fact that, from this episode through the rest of the series, until his death at the end of Star Trek Nemesis, Data's head is 500 years older than the rest of his body. It's an inventive way to resolve the plot, and it's just weird. Time Zero is ultimately pretty inconsequential, and maybe that's why it isn't remembered as well as The Best of Both Worlds, or even Descent, the two-parter that bridges seasons six and seven, and isn't nearly as good of an episode, but does feature the returns of both Lore and Hugh, and introduces concepts related to the Borg that would be revisited by a subsequent series. Nothing that happens in Time's Arrow really matters in the long term. Yeah, Data's head now being 500 years old is a goofy detail, but it doesn't change anything about Data going forward. Yeah, now we know more about the history between Picard and Guinan, which I like, but it's nothing we really needed to know, and again, it doesn't change anything going forward. 
It doesn't have the stakes or the breathless edge of your seat cliffhanger of best of both worlds. And yet, I like it anyway. Would I rate it as one of my favorite episodes? Probably not. It's not much more than an entertaining adventure story, but it's a good entertaining adventure story. It's cleverly plotted, decently paced, has a good sense of humor, is filled with offbeat touches, has some well-written and occasionally kind of heartwarming moments between the characters, and unlike many two-parters, including generally superior episodes like Best of Both Worlds, it doesn't drop off noticeably in the second half. Part two is just as engaging and exciting as part one. Do I like it when Star Trek has something deeper to say about our world? Sure. Do I like it when Star Trek's heroes find a way to resolve the conflict without firing a bunch of torpedoes and killing the bad guys? You bet. Do I think it's important for Star Trek to show characters revealing the shortcomings of Starfleet and the Federation so that we in the audience will be encouraged to examine the shortcomings of our own societies and ourselves? You're damn right I do. But that doesn't mean I don't also enjoy the occasional romp. Offer me a witty, well-crafted, funny, and heartfelt adventure story like Time's Arrow, and I'm not likely to turn it down. Ever. Those are my thoughts on Time's Arrow. What do you think? of this episode. Please share your thoughts with me in the comments. If you'd like to support this channel, and I sure wish you would if you can afford it, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Steve Shimes, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or by making a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button or via PayPal or Venmo. Links are in the description. Don't forget to join me and my best friend Jason Harding this weekend for our review of episode three of season two of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which, rumor has it, also involves time travel. Our review will be up sometime on Saturday, and please come back next week for another retro review. This batch dedicated to time travel episodes continues as we move from Star Trek The Next Generation to Star Trek Deep Space Nine for a review of another two-parter and a high watermark for the franchise, Past Tense. I'll see you next week for that. Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody.